Welcome wherever you are. Great to have you at our session on mitigating gender and ethnicity biases in artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is as good as the data and the algorithm it uses. It reflects and even reinforces inherent biases, whether conscious or unconscious. And we are witnessing a big increase in AI applications in all spheres of life, uh, health, communication, transport, security. And thanks to increasing computing power, performing and cheap sensors and exponential growth of data, AI is getting more and more present in our lives. We better make sure that our current diversity gaps or other biases are not widened through artificial intelligence, but instead reduced. In this session, we will discuss how the intersections of identities and attributes shape our experience with AI, and how Europe is addressing bias and discrimination in artificial intelligence systems. I am absolutely delighted to welcome four speakers leading researchers, thinkers and activists to animate our session. Alice Bach-Kuhnke. Alice is a Swedish member of the European Parliament, vice chair of the Greens European Free Alliance Group, former Swedish Minister of Culture and Democracy. She is in the Parliament member of the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs and group coordinator in the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality. She fights for society of equal opportunities for all. We have Roger André Sora, a researcher at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, in charge of interdisciplinarity studies of culture and of neuromedicine and movement science. He leads research on digitalization and robotization of society and the ethical and gendered impl implications of this. Among his many fields of interest, he has a special interest in Japanese technology and culture. Meredith Whitaker, who joins us from New York, she's professor at the New York University, where she co-founded and directs the AI Now Institute, an institute researching the social implications of artificial intelligence and related technologies. Meredith is active and famous in the Silicon Valley, but not only there. Um, active globally in tackling sexual harassment, gender in inequality, and racism in tech. This year, in 2020, the Forbes magazine ranked her the sixth most influential modern tech leader. And last, but certainly not least, Kathleen Müller. She is president of Ally, an independent organization promoting responsible uh, AI. She's a member of the EU high-level expert group on AI and advises other institutions like the Council of Europe uh, on AI, human rights and democracy. She advocates a human-in-command approach to artificial intelligence, where humans retain control also about when and how to use AI in their, our daily lives. To make best use of our precious time, please put your questions and comments on Slido. Uh, the code is RI20. You can also use this chat function to communicate with yourself. To test Slido, we, have asked, uh, we will ask you some very uh, difficult questions about AI. Have a look, connect, uh, and then we will collect your questions after the intervention from our speakers in order to enter into a dialogue. So without further ado, I give the floor to you, Alice, for your opening statement. Alice, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I would like to thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to this forum. It, it, it is incredibly important for us as legislators to listen to and, and learn from science. We humans are creatures of comfort. We want solutions that uh, make life easier and more efficient. 
the opportunities to use AI in ways that benefit our societies are almost endless. For example, AI can help us create circular economies and smart, low-carbon societies in line with the UN sustainability goals. But with this great potential comes great responsibility. Discrimination on a human level is reality, but it is possible to identify the root of the problem and succeed to improve the situation. With AI, it's more difficult. The prejudice or ignorance of one person can be replicated in algorithm-driven decisions that touch millions of people. Of course, it will always be difficult to design a fair and unbiased system in a society that is unequal, but we should not accept AI systems that discriminate against people. A, a recruiting system that filters out female applicants, a policy tool that does uh, racial profiling, a bank application that gives lower credit to women than men of the same financial situation, or a, a facial recognition system that is less likely to recognize black people. These are all unacceptable examples of discrimination. We, we often talk about the, pre, the, the principle about being precautionary in relation to the environment. We want to be careful. I believe it will be applicable also for AI. We, we cannot risk exposing our citizens to, disc uh, to a discriminatory system in the name of innovation. We need to make sure that the legislation we adopt is fit for purpose. In the field of AI, we should introduce equality and non-discrimination by design. Like, like we did in the field of the data protection by introducing privacy by design, 20 years after the first mobile device hit the market. And in this regard, there are two aspects that I would like to address. First of all, we need a value-based approach to technical, uh, technological development. The EU Charter of Fundamental Rights should protect us in all aspects of our lives including the field of AI. For example, when we design the future VISOM legislation, where AI could potentially be used to identify traffickers and even victims of trafficking, we must ensure that this is done in full compliance with the Race Equality Directive that prohibits profiling based on race and ethnicity. At the European Parliament, we have been pushing for an ethical legal framework on EU level for the field of AI. The General Data Protection Regulation showed us that it is possible to create horizontal legislation in the digital sphere. I welcome the promise from the Commission that the forthcoming proposal for a horizontal legislation on AI will address racial and gender-based discrimination specifically. In June this year, the European Parliament appointed a special committee on artificial intelligence. In the Green Group, we will push for this committee to focus particularly on the aspects of ethics and discrimination. The Parliament is also working on our own initiative report on the framework of ethical aspects of AI, uh, robotics and related technologies. And secondly, we need a closer cooperation between academia and policy making. When we work together, we have a better chance of addressing these fundamental issues 
and legislating in a way that supports rather than hinders the societal development we need. To conclude, I was really inspired by Ursula von der Leyen's, President von der Leyen's idea of an innovation Bauhaus for the green transition. So why not create a similar EU platform for AI that really focus on the social dimension of sustainable development and in particular on how AI can be used to fight racism and discrimination. Thank you. I'm looking forward uh, to learn more from the other speakers on this panel. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. Regulation fit for purpose to allow us as comfort creators of comfort to go beyond our comfort zone and end what you say is unacceptable, the discrimination based on gender and other attributes. So, Roger André, over to you. Uh, there was also the point of a closer, Alice made the point of a closer cooperation between academia and policy. Over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Peter. And can I please uh, have my slide uh, starting? Uh, thank you for inviting me to this session. I'm thrilled to be here and to discuss this topic with you. Uh, very good points from the first speaker. We cannot let technology alone decide what is fair. When we work together, we can best solve these issues. Uh, I'm Roger Sora, and I work as a researcher at NTNU Norway. For the last year, I have been engaged in a European Commission expert group called Gendered Innovation 2, where my subgroup has mapped gender and diversity issues in AI and robotic research, and in particular in EU-funded projects. So I would like to share some key insights with you. Uh, but first, some initial questions to ask ourselves is um, uh, for our research projects. What is lost through uh, gender mainstreaming practices? We know that counting men and women in projects is not enough and can perpetuate bias because we must ask ourselves which women and which men, and also what about non-binary people? There is also a risk of tokenism, for example, if you hire someone just because the company needs to hire a woman. In addition, it is important to take intersectional issues into account. More diversity is excellent, but don't just fill quotas. If you need someone of a certain gender and a person of color, don't combine all quotas into that one person who has all the diversity criteria. Uh, but next, I want to give you some examples of AI bias that we have mapped in this uh, group. So next slide, please. Uh, first, one example comes from MIT, the MIT project Gender Shades, which discovered that leading tech companies' commercial AI systems significantly misgender women and darker-skinned individuals. If you are a lighter-skinned male, there is almost a 100% chance that your face will be correctly identified as such. But for women, especially with darker skin, there was at worst a one-third chance for misidentification. Uh, next slide. Three other examples are, first, how machine translation implicitly genders certain words between languages that have a varying degree of gendered words. For example, between Turkish and English, as you can see here, where Turkish does not have gendered pronouns like he or she. Uh, studies of natural language processing techniques showed how cooks and nurses were translated to be female occupations uh, from Turkish to English, while engineers and doctors were translated to be male occupations. Uh, however, the translation has recently changed. Uh, today, when I checked, for example, they were flagged as translations are gender specific. But this shows that there is a complexity here that we cannot leave to machines alone to understand. We need a human intervention. The next example is social robots, which are often gendered as female through appearance, voice, and name, to mention some. Uh, and as my research points out, the more humanoid a robot becomes, the more we humans tend to gender it. Uh, just think about your robot vacuum cleaner, if you have one, for example. Does it have a name, and does it have a gender? And what does that imply? The third example is about machine learning and data sets, where you should ask yourself, if you have a data set, which people are represented in that? And more importantly, who are not represented in that? Uh, next. 
So uh, summarized in this very short introduction, key questions to take away for tech developers are, uh, have diverse groups been represented in the design and development of your product? For example, when developing gerund technology, such as social robots, is training being outsourced to grandchildren and what implication does this have for childless older adults? Uh, as AI can both produce and reproduce bias, ask yourself what feeds into the data sets. For example, hiring algorithms that base their data on data sets that favored men as applicants might disregard women, as we have seen examples of. Uh, and research shows that biased societal values towards people of color, ageism, misogyny, and homophobia can be encoded in tech. Uh, for example, why are service and chat robots portrayed as female, and what does this mean for the tech users? Uh, and these are just some examples of bias in AI that are important to discuss and to implement in research projects, uh, programs, and true funding. So the, the purpose of the expert group, Gendered Innovation 2, was to help us better implement this in the next framework program, Horizon Europe. Uh, and I would like to take this opportunity to let you know that a full report will soon be available with new methodologies, case studies covering all the Horizon Europe clusters, with policy and practical recommendations for applicants and reviewers to better integrate sex and gender-based analysis in Horizon Europe. And there is a co-design session today called Get Ready, a new era for equality is calling at 5 p.m. with the Director General about new provisions for gender equality in Horizon Europe, which I hope that many of you will attend. Uh, next. And thank you. That was uh, all for me for now. And I look forward to discussing this with the other panelists too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. I, I noted your plea that the complexity is such that we cannot leave it to machines alone. That triggers quite a number of questions. You gave one of them. Um, in the design of the systems, uh, the groups who are working on AI, do we have enough diversity? And probably the answer often is no. And this is uh, a risk uh, to be, which can be increased with application of AI. So let's, uh, let's hear now from Meredith. Uh, Meredith, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Uh, my name is Meredith Whitaker, and I am the Mindaroo Research Professor at New York University and the co-founder of the AI Now Institute. AI Now is the first university research institute dedicated to studying the social implications of artificial intelligence and algorithmic technologies. Now, the role of AI in our core social institutions is expanding. AI is shaping access to resources and opportunity both in government and in the private sector with profound implications for hundreds of millions of people globally. These systems are being used to judge who should be released on bail, to automate disease diagnosis, to hire, monitor, and manage workers, and to persistently track and surveil the public using technologies like facial recognition. These are a few examples among hundreds. But in short, AI is quietly gaining power over our lives and institutions. Now, at the same time, AI systems are slipping farther away from core democratic protections like due process and the right to refusal. In light of this, it is urgent that governments act to ensure AI is accountable, fair, and just. Because this is not what's happening right now. We at AI Now, along with many other researchers, have documented the ways in which AI systems encode bias, produce harm, exacerbate power asymmetries, and differ dramatically from many of the claims made by the AI companies who profit from AI's rapid proliferation. Voice recognition hears masculine sounding voices better than feminine voices. Facial recognition fails to recognize black and transgendered faces. Automated hiring systems discriminate against women candidates, medical diagnostic systems don't work for dark-skinned patients, and the list goes on with new examples added frequently that reveal a persistent pattern of gender and race-based discrimination encoded and amplified in AI systems. Now, when regulators, researchers, and the public seek to understand and remedy these harms, they're faced with structural barriers. This is because the AI industry is profoundly concentrated. It's controlled by just a handful of private tech companies who rely on corporate secrecy laws and structural obscurity that make independent testing and auditing nearly impossible. This also means that much of what we know about AI is written by the marketing departments of these same companies. 
they highlight hypothetical benevolent uses and remain silent about the application of AI to fossil fuel extraction, weapons development, worker control and monitoring, mass surveillance, and problems of bias and error. Information about the darker side of AI comes largely thanks to researchers, investigative journalists, and tech worker whistleblowers. Now, these companies are also notoriously non-diverse. Dr. Sarah Myers West at AI Now conducted a year-long study on diversity in the AI industry, and the results are bleak. To give an example of how bad it is, in 2018, the share of women in computer science professions dropped below 1960 levels. This means that women, people of color, gender minorities, and others are excluded from shaping how AI systems function. And this contributes to bias and discrimination. Such stark findings are one of the reasons AI now is doubling down on its gender, race, and power research program, led by Dr. Joy Lisi Rankin. Now, while the cost of such bias is borne by historically marginalized people, the benefits of such systems, from profits, from profits to efficiency, accrue primarily to those who are already in positions of power. This points to questions that go, this points to problems that go well beyond the technical. We must ask who benefits from AI, who is harmed, and who gets to decide. This is a fundamental set of questions that need to look beyond the technical and beyond questions of bias that aim to ensure systems of surveillance and social control recognize all people equally. This will not solve issues of abuse of power nor will it ensure that AI is implied in ways that promote justice. In the face of mounting criticism, tech companies are adopting ethical principles and voluntary measures. These are a positive start, but they don't substitute for meaningful public accountability. Indeed, we've seen a lot of public relations and a lot of marketing, but we've seen no examples where such ethical promises are backed by public enforcement. Just this week, a Twitter image cropping algorithm was demonstrated to be biased in favor of whiter, more male images. This is another in a long line of familiar examples. Now, Twitter apologized, and the company explained that the system had been examined for bias before it was released. But clearly, this voluntary measure was not sufficient. Powerful AI systems are reshaping our social institutions in ways that we're unable to measure or contest. These systems are developed by a handful of private companies whose market interests don't always align with the public good and who shield themselves from accountability behind claims of corporate secrecy. When we are able to examine these systems, too often we find that they are biased in ways that replicate historical patterns of discrimination. And all of this is happening in the context of rising global authoritarianism. It is, imper it is imperative that governments ask act to pass regulation in the public interest, ensuring that these systems are accountable, accurate, contestable, and that those most at risk of harm have a say in how or whether these systems are used. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meredith. This was a so sharp analysis. You're, you're pointing to persistent patterns of discrimination. Uh, a wake-up call for many of us, and um, that will lead me to one of the questions I have later, later to, to Elise. But before that, um, let's give the floor to Katlein Müller. Katlein, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you so much for having me um, uh, talk about this very important topic. Um, and um, when we listen to Meredith, um, I must say that I am uh, uh, happy that we uh, are dealing with this in the European Union, because here we somehow can do already and have already done many of the things or are working on many of the things that, that Meredith mentions. Um, let me start by, by saying uh, where I come from. Um, three years ago, I wrote a report for the European Economic and Social Committee in which I uh, identified the impact of artificial intelligence on our society. And that report kicked up a debate um, on 
the impact of AI and how we should implement AI in a responsible manner here in Europe. And it led to the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence, of which I was a member, in which we drafted ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. And these ethics guidelines um, are based on three principles, and that is that AI should be lawful, so it should be in line with the law, it should be ethical, or the AI use should at least be ethical, and it should be socio-technically robust. Let me start with the lawfulness, because these were ethical guidelines, but then we decided in the group to have as a basis the lawfulness. There are many um, uh, high-profile people that say AI is a completely unregulated technology. Um, and there are even people that say, you know what, what if we um, try to set up some structure where we give legal responsibility, so uh, responsibility for damages to the AI itself. Um, and when I ask people, why would we do this? Why would we give, give a legal personality? Because that is what we would be doing to a tool. Then uh, there are people that say, well, if I develop something um, with AI in it, and I'm under pressure because there's an AI race and I want to be the first mover, and it's not really there. I know I need to patch some things, but I just send it out there and it does something. It causes harm. Who would be liable? And my answer always is, if a dog bites a child, we don't sue the dog. We sue the owner of the dog. And if the child, if we go a step further, kicks a ball and breaks the window of the neighbor, we don't sue the child. We sue the parents. And we go even further than that. If the neighbor goes crazy and he smacks down the child and, and we, we, we put him... Um, uh, under supervision, we think he is ill and there's something wrong with him. So, and, and what I want to say with that is that AI does not operate in a lawless world. There are many, many AI regulations, rules and regulations, especially in Europe, out there that apply to this technology just the same as it applies to any other technology. The fundamental rights were already mentioned. There is the liability laws that have been out there for ages and scrutinized and optimized. There is laws that deal with trade in dual-use technology. There is laws that deal with road traffic, if you're looking at self-driving cars, for example. Laws that deal with um, medical devices. So there is a lot of regulation already out there, and we should not forget that, that can deal with AI and uh, potential harms that it could cause, uh, much in the same way as it deals with other tools and other activities. Um, and my, uh, even three years ago, my advice to um, uh, the institutions here in Europe, to everybody whom I talk to is, what you should do now, and, and I'm happy that that is happening, what you should do now is look at all these laws and look and see if they are fit for purpose in a world with AI. And fortunately, that is what is already happening here in the European Union. The uh, liability laws have been looked at, for example, but we now really need to look at the medical devices uh, regulation that has been postponed for a year. Is that still, is that fit for purpose, for example? I call that an AI legal stress test. That needs to be done. Um, so what did we do on the ethical part of the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI? We set seven requirements for trustworthy AI. And those requirements range from human agency to data governance to safety to non-discrimination, fairness and inclusion, to transparency through accountability. So if you look at those guidelines, you have a lot of uh, means that can help you navigate all the issues that, that uh, have been talked about by the previous speakers in AI. 
It's not to say that we're there already. I mean, the European Commission is working on AI regulation and is working on 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 filling the gaps that that are uh, that are there. But they are also drawing from these seven requirements for trustworthy AI. So, for example, uh, there uh, might Kathleen, be. Can I yes. can, can I interrupt you there? It's super interesting, but I Too think long? <laughs> I, I, I think we should go to the discussion. It's very important right. what you say. Um, so, because the question is now, uh, as Alice mentioned, uh, horizontal law on AI in Europe. And listening to Meredith with the really sharp analysis about the bias in the AI technology companies and the concentration there, yeah. can we achieve a law and then even have the hope that it can be implemented given these persistent patterns? Perhaps Alice first to you and then Katline to you. Well, I think what is important is what uh, Katline also said, that we need to stress test the, the laws that we have. And uh, if they are not up for it, if they can't pass the stress test, we of course need new laws. And But I think it's really important, crucial, that these new laws are uh, made uh, or based on knowledge. And that's why, as I mentioned in my opening speech, I think increased cooperation between the academia and the policy makers are totally essential uh, to, to be successful and uh, to make sure that we really get the best of use of AI for us humans. Thank you. Katlein, is it possible, this stress test in your experience? To make uh, the laws yes, implementable, think, enforceable. Uh, yes, I think I think it is definitely possible, but we would really need to um, um, uh, we really need to make people aware of the fact that these laws exist, and that also the companies that deal that deal that develop artificial intelligence that they have to obey by them, and we need also uh, to make policymakers aware of um, the, the, the effects, the ill effects and the risks that AI brings to the table, like Meredith said, so that both these operators know that, know what is happening. Because if you think it's just some software and it doesn't do a lot of harm and it is always neutral, that is simply not true. So there needs to be done a lot also with awareness and knowledge, uh, both from the side of the policymaker when it comes to the technology and the effects of it, as well as the side from the technologist as to the laws that they have to abide with. Okay. Um a question to, to, to you, Roger, because in academia, and you, you mentioned one of the questions that in the groups, if you develop something, you need to ensure diversity in these groups. In your work on robotization, has the LGBTQI community been involved? That is a very good uh, question, and it is often a group that is not included, so the short answer is uh, not enough and too little. Uh, for example, there are examples of misgendering uh, queer people and not taking gender identity into consideration when developing programs. Uh, we see, for example, on um, social media, gay men are often uh, misgendered as women. And we also see examples of um, drag queens, for example, being censored as worse than white supremacists. And of course, if you live in a less inclusive society, being outed on social media can uh, even be a death sentence. So it's really important, I think, to uh, remember that technology is never neutral. It carries uh, uh, cultural values, norms and priorities, both from developers and users. Thank you. A short reminder to you uh, following the session, please uh, go on Slido. I, I, you've seen, I, I'm surprised uh, how balanced the answer was whether uh, AI technolo technology companies were uh, denying the bias. Uh, um, I, I would have expected 100% yes, they are denying, but it was quite balanced. So please uh, use the Slido now to uh, also interact with our panelists. Meredith, I have a, a double question to you. Uh, you. You referred to the deeply rooted discrimination. Uh, and uh, is it 
is it gender as much as diversity um, or have we achieved more on fighting gender biases? And secondly, something or, or not. Huh? And secondly, um, if you look at what's happening in Europe, do you think we can be successful with this horizontal law uh, banning discrimination in AI? I, uh, thank you for that question. I think when you look at the companies that are responsible for the majority of AI systems and the infrastructure on which the majority of AI run, run um, you know, we see a perpetuation of non-diverse, a, a lack of diversity. I think, you know, there have been a number of initiatives that have claimed to address uh, uh, discrimination and racism and misogyny within these environments. Uh, but we have not seen a significant shift in who has power at these companies and who is actually empowered to create these systems. Um, but I think the, the issues of racism, misogyny, and discrimination go beyond the walls of these companies because the, the way in which these, these AI systems are being marketed and sold are, are not making the benefits of these systems available to the people who will likely bear the harm. So these systems are being created for businesses, they're being created for governments, they are not being created for empowered community applications. And I think we need, again, to look both at the way in which these, these companies are, are perpetuating non-diverse environments, the way that affects these systems, and the, the profit motive and the power asymmetries that guide the use of these systems. Who gets to use them and who are they used on? And those things are equally important in addressing uh, questions of justice and fairness in AI systems and their use. Thanks a lot. Um, we have some questions from the audience coming up, uh, I hope we can show them also on the screen. But before that, one question please to, to you, uh, Alice. Um, what is the discussion in your uh, committee on civil rights and um, um, rule of law um, on the existing anti-discrimination um, legislation? Is the legislation up to date with the technologies? Are we at speed, or do we need to be flexible and faster? Well, that was a leading question. We, we definitely need to be more flexible and, and faster. And I also, I mean, being a politician uh, ch chosen by the people to represent them in all the developments going on, I think I, think I and my colleagues, uh, politician colleagues within the European Parliament and in the national parliaments in the member states, we have a huge responsibility to, to raise awareness among ourselves as uh, uh, legislators, but also uh, among the people that uh, within our communities. Because, I mean, I who have been fighting discrimination and racism for my whole life uh, and the structural racism, I have been doing this in my whole life uh, with AI developing. I mean, I know that there are so many people uh, within politics, in businesses, in, in the civil society, who are not even recognizing racism at, in the first place. So we have, a, we have such a big uh, knowledge gap when it comes to what really is a hinder, an obstacle in people's uh, uh, possibilities to live free lives. And that's why I was calling for, for, for awareness among me and my, my fellow colleagues, because we as legislators, we need to do so much more, because today I feel, when I have discussions like this, talking with developers in, in companies or talking with academia, I hear that you, have so much knowledge, and I see that we politicians are are, are lacking in this knowledge. I, I mean, every, this conversation makes me even more worried. We need to do so much more. Thank you. Very clear, very strong plea. Thanks a lot for that. So let's look at the, at the questions we have from our audience, and thanks a lot for interacting here. So the first one is, and I put it to all four of you, 
how do we address bias in AI if we do not have data on race and ethnicity in most of our health data sets? So that's perhaps something for Roger, for you. Do we need this data? Can we improve the data sets? It is a very good question, and it is um, also a difficult question to answer um, because it depends how we ask for that data and if it is needed in the first place. Um, of course, we have seen quite a lot of examples of uh, race playing a major role in both access to and what type of healthcare people can receive. And in that regard, it is very important that there is knowledge about this. But then again, it could be used um, for uh, for more um, uh, racial division. So it, it's a uh, it's a question that uh, you really need to apply it to the specific context I, and the specific project. I see. There's a link question to that. Should the hardware accelerators adapt to better compensate data and generalize. Is that an option? Uh, could you repeat the, the question? Yeah, it's, it's, how deep do you think the bias in AI is? No, sorry. Um, could uh, Now the, the question has changed. So the, no, the question is, should the hardware accelerators adapt to better generalize, to compensate for the uh, incompleteness of data. I see Meredith uh, shaking her head. So, the art, Meredith, the floor is your, yours. Uh, I guess I don't completely understand that question, the last part in particular. I'll start with the addressing the question of data. I think it is, you know, there could be instances in which addressing specific types of bias requires that kind of data. But again, bias doesn't live solely in the data. It lives in the way in which the, the model was created and trained. It lives in the way in which a given AI company's sales department may have made promises about the efficacy of a given system to hospitals or others who are purchasing it. It lives in the training that a nurse or a doctor may receive to use the system. It lives in the biases that may reside in the medical facility. And in the U.S. in particular, it lives in our extremely Byzantine uh, kind of privatized healthcare system, where you have insurance and hospital chains sort of responsible for you know, covering some medical conditions and not others. You have people who have some access to care and not others. And that is, of course, split along racial and gendered lines. So I, I want to really push back on this notion that simply by including more data or tweaking the data a little bit, we can eliminate bias. Bias is not a statistical property, ensuring that these systems recognize all people equally without any distinction is not necessarily going to solve the harms that are produced by the use of these systems in complex environments like healthcare. Um, now, on the question of the accelerator, I again don't quite understand what that is referring to. But if you know the the premise of the question is that somehow a more powerful computational system can generalize from missing data and fill in the gaps. Yeah. Um, that's not how it works. It means okay. you're generalizing from an incorrect assumption, okay. and uh, that generalization would carry that those inaccuracies okay. with it. Okay, understood. Thanks a lot. We're coming to the end of our session, but there's a very short question to cut line. Do we have a risk of overregulation, which would stifle innovation? Your mic, please. And very uh, brief. No, we don't. We don't. No, we don't. Uh, no, no. I always hear people say, don't stifle innovation. And uh, my answer always is, uh, don't stifle responsibility for what you do. I mean, um, I, I want to, if I, I know I have one minute, but I want no, to make no, one No, no, no. You have 10 seconds because the session. Oh, <laughs> no. 
<laughs> then then we we cannot over regulate this because this is too impactful understood we need to thank you <laughs> understood thank you so much we heard how deeply rooted bias and discrimination is how risky it is to have the concentration in technology companies how important the role of the legislator is it's not enough to be against discrimination racism we have to act and you are the actors Thank you.